Shitty marketing pisses me off. I get visibly angry when I see bad marketing experiences, and I see a lot because I click everything. Um, but when I go to a new city to speak, I kind of reset. I'm like, okay, clean slate, and then I play tourist. I go to Google and I search for something relevant to that city. So Boston, I search for a harbor cruise. This is what I want to do. Uh, I get this ad, looks promising. I'm going to click on that. And I get this. Come on, now I'm angry again. This is so shitty. Bullshit. <laughs> there is so much bullshit marketing out there. Uh, man, that's not nice, it's not fair. It's not fair to me, because I see all of it. Um, but it's not fair to our customers and to our visitors. They shouldn't be seeing experiences like that. They should be seeing more like this. You can watch that GIF all day long. I don't know, what, some LSD they gave the kid or something. But <laughs> totally spaced out. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about, how to make delightful marketing. Marketing that makes people feel happy. Now, this is my favorite campaign of all time. Shreddies, they took Shreddies, they rotated them by 45 degrees, made a new product that actually sold better. That's really cool. And coincidentally, there are four corners on Shreddies. So that's a nice segue into this talk. Um, when, whatever you're doing, any part of marketing, I'm talking landing pages specifically, but you can apply it to anyone on your website, email, doesn't matter. There are only four ways to look at it. There's copy design, interaction, and psychology. If you understand all of them, you can design an experience, which is good, which is effective, which is delightful. Now, it's big, it's massive. Like There's a London Underground map here of all the things in it, so I'm not, I can't talk about all of it, but I'm gonna break it down. I'll do, I'll do each one, I'll go around in order, and then at the end, I'll come back to two important elements of your page, video and forms, and show you how you can apply them specifically to something like that, so you'll see how it all comes together. And warning, uh, if, you, if you follow this advice, your marketing might actually get a little bit better. So starting with copy, there's a lot going on here. Uh, the, the elements on your page, everything, all the text there, then there's, uh, Context, clarity, congruence, there's voice of you. What's your tone, your language, maybe based on your core values of your company. And then there's voice of customer. And how do you bring those two things together in your writing? So these are all the elements. Most people focus on the headline, call to action, but there are smaller things like the, uh, what's it called, the field labels on your forums, or how you write your privacy, privacy statement. They can have a profound impact on the performance of your pages, and then there's information hierarchy. This is getting your story in the correct order so someone's not having to hunt around your page to read it correctly. Copy comes before design. You write your campaign copy, then create an experience to present it visually. In this example here, quote from Man Stabbed, what are you gonna do, stab me? That makes sense. The context is established, and then there's the quote. If it was the other way around, it wouldn't make sense. Looking at all these landing pages, I've seen maybe 50,000. Um, I tried to spot trends, and I started seeing one when I saw this Qualaroo page. This is the headline and subhead. I'm like, all of the clarity here is in the subhead. The, first, the headline's kind of throwaway. It doesn't really, it's not helpful. It doesn't really tell you anything. It's all in the subhead. And that, uh, Out of order. Who the hell do you think you're talking to? <laughs> it's in the wrong order. Um, then I saw, again, are there any HubSpot employees in the room here? Okay, you wanna close your ears for a little bit? Uh, I saw it again here. Headline, useless, but then all the clarity in the subhead. Now instead of just complaining about it, I wanted to run an experiment to see if something's going on here. When someone arrives at your page, they only have a few seconds to figure out what it's about. So I ran a five second test. Now, if you don't know what it is, you get a screenshot, you flash it for five seconds, and then you ask a question. So with this HubSpot page, I removed the logo and their name from the subhead so there was no brand recognition. And I asked the question, what does the product do? And this, <laughs> this is the answer. <laughs> Nobody had a fucking clue what HubSpot does. <laughs> Not a single person. So what I did was, I flipped it. 
put it in the other order, put the subhead with the clarity, put that first. I ran it again. What does the product do? That's what HubSpot does, right? Massive change. That's a lift of infinity, because it went from zero to 60. That's a massive change just by flipping it. So look at your landing pages. If you have a subhead and a headline, flip it and see what clarity it adds. Run an experiment like that. It's cheap, easy, you know, it's very quick. And if you get something like that, a result like that, you know you should be running an A-B test, a bit more scientific, to see if you can make your page easier to understand. Here's a chat on someone's phone. So uh, I'm just going to read it out. So how was the date last night? First date, we uh, went to dinner, then walked her home. Then I killed her in the woods outside her house and left. That seems a bit harsh. Did you order lobster at dinner? Right? We've, all, we've all had this. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, the, the autocorrect problem. My point is that what we say and what other people hear are often two entirely different things. Here are a few examples. Maybe a bit more applicable to Elton. <laughs> Probably my favorite. It's a death row pardon. Two minutes too late. Now that actually would be ironic, unlike every other line in that song. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ready, 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 ready. Good luck getting that out of your head for the rest of the day. <laughs> if you run experiments like that, if you notice you have a clarity problem, a good exercise to do is to ask your customer to write your headline for you. Because they're going to have all of the built-in insight as to why they were successful, why they decided to become a customer. And their language is going to be very different to yours. Does anyone know what the most persuasive word is in the English language? You. <laughs> Ollie? <laughs> uh, no. It's... Because, 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 because. Because we're, we're uh, primed as children our whole lives. When you're a kid and you say, Mommy, why is the sky blue? Your parent replies with, because, la, la, la. So we're constantly trained that anything that follows the word because is correct and is important. So I'm going to share some data with you that hasn't been seen before from the Unbounce back end. We looked at thousands and thousands of landing pages to see if we could find some trends in the data. And I, I looked up um, use of the word because on a landing page. This is kind of how it goes. So uh, that's not good. Don't believe you. It gets worse and worse. But if you say it 11 times, <laughs> all of a sudden, it kind of works. This is a little bit of a joke. It's a low sample size. I'll keep digging, but I don't know. Say it a lot. <laughs> OK, moving on to design. Now, again, you have all the elements. I'm not going to talk about those, like anything that's visual. What I am going to talk about is attention-driven design. So these are principles that you can apply to help people, to focus people's attention on what you want them to see and to do. There are 23 principles. I'm not going to go through all of them. Let's click there. Because um, that's a lot. I'll just do a few of them. So distraction. This is the first one. The problem with home pages for campaign traffic is that there's so much traffic, everybody wants a piece. Every department, every stakeholder. I mean, the only redeeming factor on this page is that little bit of white space. There, that's the only nice bit. And then a stakeholder gets their hands on this, and what happens? put a fucking banner in there, and it just gets worse. <laughs> this is what's going on on this page. This could take a while. The attention ratio is 82 to 1. Now, this is the ratio of the number of things you can do on a page to the number of things you should be doing. And when you're running a marketing campaign, there's only ever one goal, so there should be one thing on the page. There are 81 things on this page in opposition to what someone should be doing. 
Uh, I was in Edinburgh last week speaking, and my sister lives there, and she had a problem with the pipes in her kitchen, so I searched for the best 24-hour plumber. I get this again, looks pretty good. Wrong, <laughs> wrong slide. And it, it takes me to a homepage. Now, I'm gonna walk through the three kind of things that most marketers do. They'll choose a homepage to send it to, or an internal site page, or they'll use a dedicated landing page. Now, again, I went back and I did a five-second test on this. What service does this company offer? 30% got it right. There are other things there, and they offer those, but not many people knew that this was actually a plumber, and that's a problem. So, okay, next step. Let's focus a bit more. Let's go to the plumbing page. Now we have plumbing highlighted. There's a little bit of change here, but not a lot. 40%, it's getting better. So now I'm gonna fix this and make it more of a dedicated experience. So first of all, I'll take away the social share buttons. Nobody's gonna go on LinkedIn and talk about the amazing plumbing experience they had with you. <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. Don't do that. I'm gonna take away the navigation, so it's just plumbing. Take away the building image and rework some of the copy to say plumbing. 80%, it's that easy. Removing those distractions, you will get a lift in conversions almost every time. Now here's some evidence of that. Okay, this is the conversion rate, average conversion rate according to the number of links on a page, number of distractions. It's a fairly predictable downward trend when you add more links. But the interesting thing is, the average number of links is 4.39. So that means there are thousands of marketers who can increase their conversion rates just by removing three links. It's a massive opportunity for thousands of businesses. Try and get to an attention ratio of one to one, as close as you can. Sometimes it's hard to remove everything. Oh, and that chart as well, that was for lead gen pages, and I ignored things like privacy policy and terms and conditions, because they're fine. They're not really distractions that anyone's gonna click on, so that's okay. And sometimes that's good. If you're doing PPC, having that link to your primary domain is a good thing for Google. Anomaly, okay, I did a podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago and someone sent me the screenshot. Now which one stands out? It's that one, right? That's all I needed to do to become the best thing on this list. And for a long time, it's gonna be the only one that stands out. It's anomalous. Who do you look at in this photo? Nobody, right? You look at the group as a whole. How about now? Now you're looking at me, because I'm the only one <laughs> being an asshole and wearing sunglasses in a bar at night. But you get the point, right? Look at it graphically, which square do you look at? None of them, it's just like, uh, squares. If you rotate it, all of a sudden this is the one that stands out. Imagine you're putting on an event and these are all speakers. Let's say you're running social campaigns, like every day, like featured speaker. When they come to this, if you've done that, they'll be like, oh, that's who they were talking about. And it stands out, you don't have to do anything else. And it's also just the perfect place to put <laughs> a diamond shreddy. <laughs> it's convenient. <laughs> proximity. Um, when something is in close proximity to something else, they're perceived to have a relationship. So if you took four of the Jacksons and put them over here, nobody would care. Right? You put them with Michael, all of a sudden they're talented and, and they're important, right? Because the proximity to the guy actually is awesome um, until later in life. Uh, so let's have a look at a few examples of proximity because it's very dangerous. This is a course I wrote. All you need to do is click the button to continue. Right? It's just a click-through page based on a case study I wrote, uh, wrote read, uh, called the Hobson's Plus One Choice Effect where people like to make a choice. They feel happy when they make a successful choice. I put a link here to start a free trial of Unbounce. It's quite aggressive. It's a lot more than just clicking through. 14% less people clicked the button just because that was there. Now I'm thinking, well, if everybody clicked that and became a customer, that's amazing. I'll forego the course if I do that. 2,000 people went through this A-B test. Only one person clicked that link and became a customer. So just by increasing the attention ratio in close proximity to the call to action, it killed conversions. I tried another one. I was doing uh, qualitative research, why aren't people taking the course? A lot of people said, how much is it? Well, it's free, it says on the button. But I wanted to reinforce this, so I said, I hope you enjoy this free course. Again, close proximity, when they're just about to click. 
<laughs> Talk about vanity metrics. That's an actual vanity metric. I even tested uh, a young, like a 10 years ago, a photo of, that didn't work either. So it's clearly, it's just because it's in close proximity. When someone's about to act and you put something else in their way, they go, huh, why are you saying that? Gives them a reason to, uh, oh, just wrote an ebook about those 23 principles. Um, you can grab it there. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. And it'll help you understand how to design an experience, kind of on purpose. Instead of just going, pretty design, you're like, oh, we need to do something here. Which principle can we use to make it more impactful? Interaction, every element on your page, well, not every element, but many of them have interactive components. And people kind of ignore that. If you think of like um, a carousel, there are about 15 interactive modes in a carousel. Uh, same with a slideshow. Uh, video has about 12. There's a lot more than you'd think. And so there's a lot of room for messing it up, right, if you don't do it correctly. So lots of things that are interactive. And each one, like these interactive things, these modes, can be a point of friction, which can hurt your conversion rates. Now, every year, there are new trends that come out, and they drive me crazy because, um, you know, they get put into themes, like on Theme Forest. Every WordPress theme has all these new kind of things, right? It was parallax and ghost buttons, and they all have carousels. There's every, and there's a, there's a thing called, I don't know what it's called. I'm calling it scroll assist or scroll control. Some people say smooth scroll, but smooth scroll to me is when you have anchor nav and you click it and it moves gently down the page so you can see what's going on. There's a video of me <laughs> interacting with this page. I'm going to try and scroll down the page. When I do, it accelerates for me, which means it, it, it doesn't stop when I stop. It just keep, keeps going. So this part is in the middle. Of it. I'm going to try and get to the middle of the page. No. No. <laughs> I have to scroll. I have to nudge it and wait to see if it, see if it will stop in the middle. <laughs> see how hard that was? It's like when you, you, know, you, you scroll a bit and then take your hand off and it'll go, it'll keep going. It's terrible. These things are just infecting all of these these pages, and some people don't know any better, right? They, they don't have any dev or design skills, so they grab a, a theme and it has these horrible experiences in it. Like carousels as well. I mean, what design principle they're using here? It's like invisibility, I think. You know, you've got these two ghost buttons, and you have the nav here. It's impossible to, to find them. You know, we've all experienced it. You get there, you're like, ooh, this is interesting. <gasps> and it leaves, and you're like, fuck, and then you've got to find the little dot, and you're like, you know, it's just a crappy experience. This is one, a test done, and this was on a non-autoplay carousel. So lots of attention on the first one. These are all wasted. Wasted creative, nobody's gonna see them. But then on autoplay, it's that, you know, just that problem of you can never actually stop them when you want. Another uh, test was done. The subject here was saying, does Siemens have any special deals on washing machines? It's right there. Special on washing machines, but it was just glossed over because it looks like a banner. So carousels are just a really, really bad thing. And you have to be careful if you use a theme. Make sure you don't get one with all these flashy, flashy games and such. Interactions, every interaction we make needs to be delightful. It shouldn't be frustrating. Uh, okay, we've all seen these, right? Uh, you're, you're forced into Choosing something you don't want to choose if you want to get out of this situation. So this is the psychology portion. Now, influence is good. These are the things we possess. We can be influential. Persuasion, these are tactics we can use to help people do what we want. And then there's manipulation. And these are, this, is the, this is like SEO, white, gray, and black hat. You need to stay away from here, but people don't. I was on my phone playing a game. This is a kid's game. Right? I ran out of moves, and this comes up. Um, let's go back. So it says, try again or keep going. You have to pay to keep going, but try again. Again, this is priming. Uh, since we're kids, we're like, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Try again is positive, right? Next week I came and it says, give up. Again, we're told that giving up is a bad thing. 
So this is good cop, bad cop. Um, so what's going on? What are the psycho psychological things going on here? Urgency. So this is counting down. You're like, oh, I've got to make a decision quickly. Negativity bias. That's where negative statements are more powerful than positive ones. And then there's this good cop, bad cop thing. So I did an experiment on this as well. Uh, again, usability hub. It's a click test. And I said, um, where would you click for another game? I'm not leading them. I'm just saying, for another game, where would you click? On the try again one, most people clicked that. Then when I said give up, everybody starts shifting to the purchase side of things. That's a massive increase on people clicking that because they don't want to give up. It's negative. It's bad. That's manipulation. Can they be done well? Well, Joanna Weeb did this one. This is great. She was bugged by Bounce Exchange, who, that previous example, she was saying, don't do these. They're bad. And they said, well, can you just try it? Give it a shot. So she did. She did an, a more evil one, got a massive lift in people downloading, but then she made it nice. Here, if you click here, you're rejecting the guide. You're not some, saying something bad about yourself. So you can make these things good. OK, so now we're going to apply all of these things to video. Now, I have some data here from Wistia that they let me use. It's really, really fascinating stuff. Would you watch this video? Maybe, but how about now? OK, so what's going on here? The poster frame, the default image in there, I look like I'm drunk or something. Uh, there's a big shiny button, so you know it's a video and you can play it. It's only eight seconds. That's the psychological part. It's like, oh, that's, e that's, that's easy. It's low commitment. And then there's a caption. Right? Captions are really, really important. A couple of things about video. Not many people will actually watch it. So you have to be able to, well, actually, going back to captions, they're really important. 300% more people will read a caption on a page. The reason is, when you see a big image or a video, you're drawn to it. And then if there's a caption, you read it. So make that a really persuasive or interesting line so people go, ooh, actually, I will watch the video. Or if I can't, I'll continue and read the rest of the page. But you should be able to communicate what's going on without the video. Assume that nobody's going to watch it. We had one, an explainer video on our homepage. We spent a lot of money on it. We were really excited. We put it on there, ran a test, and it did nothing. 11% of people watched it, and it had zero impact, so we didn't put it on there. Design, what can you do with video? OK, so this is the data from Wistia. Where should you put your video? These are 250 pixel blocks. As soon as you get past about the 600 pixel mark, the engagement, the play rate goes way, way down. So the fold, such that it is, is important for engagement with your, with your videos. Now here, this is based on the size of the video player. So if you hit around the 540 by 400 mark of your video player, more people will click the play button. I think it's from 80,000 pages they looked at this for data. Then there's the interaction. OK, well, <clears throat> autoplay is kind of horrible, but there is a time when you should do it. If someone clicks a thumbnail, like in an email, that has a play button on it, taking you to a page where there's a video, have autoplay turned on because they requested to play the video. That's when you should be using it. Just like that, right? They expect it. So that's a really good use of autoplay. This is, they call it a turnstile. So when you're watching a video and you put that, the form in, say, if you want to continue, you have to fill in the form. Putting it 14% of the way through was the ideal spot. You put it at the start, everyone's like, oh, this is nasty, and they leave. Same at the end, they just give up at this point. So put it about that far into your video. And then the psychology of this. If you have an actor or a person in your video, it, it really depends on who they are, the performance of the video uh, for trust. Government, not very trustworthy. CEOs, and it goes up to experts. So if your, your boss, your CEO, wants to be in a video, you might want to tell them no. So here's an example I saw, and we'll look at the four corners. What are they doing here? So there's a caption. That's good. In close proximity to the video player, so you know it has a relationship. A little directional cue. It's not very strong, but it's there. It's encapsulated by the laptop. So it's got a container. Context of use, so the image, the poster frame, is showing what the software does. So there's a little bit of context there. 
and you can understand something. Contrast failed here. You can hardly see the button, but there was a rollover state which brought out the color. And then the length of the video, something two, two minutes, low commitment. Ooh. Okay, so forms now have a lot of data here, and it's, it's super interesting. Everybody says, how many form fields should we use? Um, yeah, yeah, one form field is going to convert better. Okay, well, let's have a look. It does, predictably. This is probably high commitment, high value items where people have a lot of motivation and they're going to go through it. But the interesting part is right here. If you're going to have four fields, you may as well have seven. <laughs> right? So ask some extra questions because you're not, you're not missing out. You're going to get the same kind of conversion rate. These are averages. So you have to test this kind of thing. But that's really good insight for when someone you know, is asking. You always have another department, sales or something, say, could we just ask this? Don't be afraid to do it. And again, opportunity costs. So four and a half is the average. So looking at it from the other, the other direction, thousands and thousands of businesses can increase the conversion rate if they just remove three fields. So it depends on what you want, quality and quantity. So putting more fields in someone's way can be a good thing. Right? We have a really unique hiring process at Unbounce. If you send us your resume, we'll just delete it or rip it up. We won't look at it. So we want you to open a free account, uh, build a landing page, and tell us why we should hire you and why you want to work for us. That's Joel. Uh, he came by our Montreal office where I work. Nice guy. We had a chat, and he gave me his resume. When he left, I just turned to the team, ripped it up, and put it in the recycling. This is another guy. Uh, he was actually retargeting us, putting Facebook ads there. So this is Corey, our marketing director. He saw this on Facebook, clicked on it. Not only did they take out paid ads, they built a landing page and wrote an e-book as to why we should hire him. That's the benefit of putting something in their way. Everybody, you know, it gets rid of all the people who are just like spraying their resume around town to every tech company. Some people that are really, really serious. And that's why we have an amazing culture, because we only get amazing people going through the process. Now, Joel, well, we didn't hire that guy. <laughs> a for effort. Uh, Joel did actually figure out how to do it. He, he actually wrote a blog post, a marketing blog post, and he's getting a customer success position. This is about our latest feature release at the time, so that's really, really cool. And other companies are copying us now with the exact same process. It's kind of fun. The point here is that you shouldn't design for customers. You should design for your ideal customer. Now, how do we do that with marketing? These are, this is the copy on your form. Now, I wanted to test. Like I said earlier, the field labels are surprisingly powerful. What I was looking for, oh, actually, first, Disney. They, uh, they put a new film out. It's for like eight to 10-year-old kids. And they started noticing that there was a massive number of people clicking the forgot password link. I'm like, why is this happening? So they look in the database, and the passwords were up to 40 letters and numbers long. I'm like, why is this happening? So like, let's go to the source. So they went back to the form. What were people asked to do when they chose their password? <laughs> well, maybe these are kids, right? <laughs> so they're getting these passwords. <laughs> Nobody's going to remember that. <laughs> All because of the field label. So I want to run a test. Here, just put your email address in here to get access to this course. Now, what I was looking for, I wanted to see if changing that text could influence the quality of people who were getting in. Now, what I was looking for were professional email addresses, so blah, blah, at yourcompany.com. I didn't want Gmail or Hotmail or AOL or whatever. With email address, this is all screwed up, never mind, 41% of them were professional. And the reason I want pro accounts is, or email addresses, now I know my email marketing is going to people while they're at work instead of when they're on the toilet later on or on the sofa. I want to speak to them, market to them when they're at work. Your best email address, 47%, a 15% lift. It's pretty good. Work email, 22% lift. And business email address, 59% lift, lift in professional emails coming in. That's a massive difference. That's designing for ideal. Uh, what should you write in your button? <laughs> Everybody talks about button copy. 
So again, we looked at data, get your free ebook versus get my. We looked at some of what happens when you change this copy. So you're on average 8.4%. My, big lift just by changing your to my. Looked at uh, action words, so get something. Click, way more impactful than get. Now, surprisingly, there weren't many people putting click on their button because you think it's too obvious, but it has a really big impact. People just like to be told what to do. And then the word free doesn't do well. Now, I have a, a missing piece here. Uh, when you take the word free out, on average, it's about a 30% lift. So be careful when you use free because a lot of the time, people don't believe you, right? Well, you, I've got to put my email address in. That's currency, so it's not actually free. And it can look like you're trying too hard, like with the free course earlier. So the design of your form. Okay, so let's look at, kind of like the Wistia one, how far down the page should your form be? Everybody's scared to move it. They think, let's just put it above the fold. Well, about 40% of the way down the page was the ideal place. That's probably because you get a chance to tell your story, information hierarchy, before you ask for the commitment, for the purchase decision, for the exchange of an email. Okay, what's wrong with this form? Well, it has inline labels and it has a capture. Two things that can be negative, I and mean, this is a trend as well, inline labels. It makes your form short, but it's dangerous from an interaction perspective. So let's look at the interaction on a form. Captures, first of all, they're ugly. I was buying tickets for a Scorpions concert. It's in, on Friday. And again, proximity. I'm just about to click, and it says, you are forbidden to access this site using an automated program. That's not a nice way to talk to me. <laughs> You're forbidden. Then I do click on it, and I get this. <laughs> I have to look at these images and go, which, one has, which ones have steak in it, and then count them. Like, this is shaved roast beef. Is that steak? Is that a quiche? <laughs> like, is this one? Is that a quiche, or is it like really rare steak? I have no idea. I had to go through this about five times before I got the right number. It's so hit and miss. I hate Ticketmaster. I would have gone straight to StubHub if I had an option. They're bad because they remove the control of your brand experience. Right? You put it in someone else's hand because it's, it's usually random. You don't know what it's going to say. You get things like this. <laughs> it's not so bad, really, but what about this one? <laughs> what if you live in Texas? And if you have grandchildren, how can you, how can you type that? That's just, that's not nice. <laughs> and this one, apart from that it looks offensive from a distance, what you have to do here is look behind the letters and figure out which ones have a cat. <laughs> the first one, I think that's a dog doing this. The second one, I think that's a cat doing that. You go across. This, when I did it, took me a minute and a half. Nobody's going to go through that. And this one, probably my favorite, you have to look down here Find the first letter, figure out what color it is. I hope it's not morning, glory, sunrise, or something. And then spell it in, 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 in the form there. So you're gonna, you, know, you have to interpret the color. You have to be a good speller. And most interestingly, you're going to lose a lot of people immediately because some people aren't going to be able to read it. Captures are bad. But can they be good? Like anything, there's a delightful option. Where does the Queen of England live? Right, that's kind of fun. You're like, no, 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 no. England. That kind of stuff's a bit more interesting. I wish one of these things would have an API so you could plug your own questions in. That would be kind of cool. Inline labels. Lots of uh, talk about these. Uh, people say, ah, oh, they're terrible. You shouldn't use them. Well, they're getting better. They're not always that bad. But some of the reasons you shouldn't Here's another example. But short-term memory. You can click in it, and the label goes away, and you're like, ah, oh, what was it? And you have to click back out again. And some of them are better now. When you click into it, it'll stay there until you start typing. That's better. But if you're a tabber, like someone on a desktop, you tab between labels, you're like, da-da-da, name, 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 tab. Oh, what's going on there? I don't know. Then I have to click outside of it. And now you're turning me into a clicker, and I'm a tabber. You're changing my behavior, which isn't fair. Um, but like I said, some of them are getting better. 
But then multitasking, you know, like, oh, someone shouts, you're like, what was that field? But then this is the problem. Like, even if you have the ones that don't disappear until you start typing, if you do something like really long, an important form, like, say, for, uh, I don't know, becoming a resident of another country, whatever it is, something important, you can't double check it. You have all of the, this form filled out, and you're like, mm, did I do it right? And you have no way, it's impossible for you to figure out before you click submit your information whether you did it right. Um, this is the guy we just hired. Uh, I'll just cover him up. He was doing the ice bucket challenge last summer, and he called me out, so I did it, and I went to donate $100 as well. well I'll do that. And I got there, and I'm just about to fill in the form and click, and I see this. They've already reached their goal. I'm like, you don't need my money. I'm not going to donate anymore. I'm going to go to the bar. <laughs> that had no place being there. If it was 80%, it'd be like, oh, that's encouragement. It's in close proximity again. I'm like, oh, I'm going to help them out. That should be on the confirmation page to say, thanks to people like you, we exceeded our goal. Then you feel better. So you have to be careful. Again, proximity. So form psychology. Uh, this, <laughs> so open-ended questions add to the cognitive strain. We're like, oh, now I've got to write a story, or like, it's, it's a bit more work. This is from a landing page for a home building company. And they say, I'm thinking of, of building a, I'm thinking of building a fucking house. What do you, <laughs> what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> You're just wasting my time with, with questions like that. This is cognitive strain. Every little bit of confusion you can give people this builds up and up, and people will make worse decisions, like no applicable options. You're like, ah, none of these apply to me, so I just make it up. I'm lying. I'm, I'm falsifying your data because you didn't give me a way out. So all of these things, um, like the, uh, that bar, that's a visual representation of a stop word. These are things that just before you're about to click, they say a word that makes you go, why are you saying that? It's, uh, I wasn't thinking about that. Spam's a classic example. <laughs> In this one, we promise we won't spam smiley face. <laughs> You're being sarcastic about my privacy. That's not, again, it's not nice. It's not delightful. Get out of people's way. Don't put anything in close proximity to your call to action. Because it's, every test I do, <laughs> I think I'm going to, I'm doing some well-meaning, I'm thinking I'm going to help. Every test I do fails when I try to put something there to tip people in favor of what I want them to do. Trust on your landing pages. Again, here's another example. One of our customers did this. So beside the call to action, put a security seal. Right? That's going to help. Your information is secure. People do this all the time. Sometimes they'll put loads of these trust seals all around the bottom of the form. Fail by 12%. Again. Stop putting things around your buttons. Give them space to breathe. People don't believe that. You're trying too hard. OK, so how do we make a really good form? Form first design. This is the idea that you design your form as if it's the only thing on the page. Because if it can stand alone and communicate what the page is about, it's a really strong foundation for your page. So here it is. It's all messed up, but that's fine. You have the headline. You have some benefits. The subhead, this is telling you why. The, form, uh, the headline is, what am I going to get? This is why I should care. Label copy for the ideal customer. A descriptive call to action, not the word submit. <laughs> Everyone talks about don't use the word submit. Now, uh, everybody knows that when you click a button, you're going to submit the form. So the word submit isn't inherently bad. It's just wasting an opportunity to be persuasive. In the data we looked at, I looked at it yesterday, Anything other than the word submit converted about 16% better than the word submit. So if you <laughs> just write anything on your call to action, <laughs> and it'll, be, it'll perform better. Uh, encapsulation design. So we're wrapping this up. It makes it important. Contrast on the call to action. Proximity, again, you know, you've got to test these things. But some urgency here can't help. A scarcity. Only three consultations remaining. That kind of thing can tip people in their favor. And then expectations. Oh, no capture. Top aligned, so not in line. Uh, scarcity. And it's really important if it's an 
any kind of consultation, you should set the expectation, I will get back to you in five minutes, 24 hours. It can eat, put people at ease and they're more likely to fill in your form. Okay, so what if we put all of these things together to create the ultimate landing page? Well, first I get a headline, then a subhead, then I'll flip the order of them, I'll put a video on there, 540 by 400, I'll put a caption, I'll put a CTA 14% of the way through, have it above the fold, I'll add a form, I'll make it seven fields, I'll change it to anything else, we could just sort of the right click to get some bullshit, I don't know. And we'll say click, and we'll put my in there, we won't say free, and then we'll put it below, I'll put it 40% of the way down the page, and then we'll say because <laughs> 11 times, just, <laughs> that will convert like a motherfucker. <laughs> if anyone tries this, send me the page, I wanna see <laughs> what it looks like. <laughs> You can get that crazy map if you want to download it and just have a look at all of the other things on there. Because it'll show you that some of these elements that you maybe didn't even think of and some of the points of friction. It's a work in progress because it's very big. Final note. It's all fucked up. <laughs> this is a barbecue. Again, there's that ebook. It's it's pretty cool. Um, so download that. It'll help you with your design. Thank you.